Welcome to a unique TYT interviews. We're in Austin for South by Southwest, and uh, we're going to do a number of interviews here. First one up is Gretchen Rubin. Now, uh, Gretchen's got a, a number of things that I want to talk to her about. Happiness, don't worry, we're going to make you happy by the end of this interview. <laughs> How's that for a tall order? But we got that on lockdown. Uh, and we're going to talk about your habits, uh, your crappy habits. Uh, you, you're going to need to cut that out, okay? And, uh, and I'm going to read, she also has a title for uh, the longest title of a book ever. <laughs> so I'm going to read that for you in a second. Also clerk for one of my favorite Supreme Court justices of all time, Sandra Day O'Connor. Yep. Uh, so uh, a person of principle who probably should not have retired from the court. Uh, but that's a different story. And just like me, was a lawyer and then quit and did something far more interesting. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot on slate here. But let me read the title of your uh, book. Better than before, what I learned about making and breaking habits to sleep more, quit sugar, procrastinate less, and generally build a happier life. That that is a Guinness record for the longest <laughs> time, right? Is, the, is half the book the title? Yeah, I love long titles because I'm like, I'm just going to tell you what it's all about. So uh, you know, you're looking it up. You're in the bookstore. Like there is, there are no secrets. Uh, I hear you. So um, okay, well let's take it one by one. First, I want to do your life a little bit, and then I want to do this book, and then your book about happiness I might be even more interested in, so there's a lot to talk about. So, you're a lawyer, uh, how long did you work as one? Well, for two years I clerked, and mm -hmm. then I worked briefly for the Federal Communications Commission, and there I was sort of a lawyer, sort of not a lawyer, and then I left to become a writer. So did you like hate four, it, were you? or were you okay with it, but you were just dying to be a writer? It's more the latter. Um, I didn't love law. I went into law for all the wrong reasons, like, oh, it's a great education, and I can change my mind later, and it'll give me a lot of options. You know, So I, I wasn't... That's exactly how my dad tricked me. Right, right. <laughs> um, so I went into it kind of not mindfully. Um, and then I did have a great experience, so it wasn't that I hated it. I had mm -hmm. really great experiences as a, lawyer, as a lawyer, but as is a something that happens to a lot of writers and people in a lot of different professions, I felt sort of a very powerful call to be a writer, and this was getting stronger and stronger until it got to the point where I thought, you know, I would really at this point rather fail as a writer than succeed as a lawyer. I had come to a point in my career where it was like a logical time to make a, a, take a risk. And I thought, if I don't do it now, I might never do it. If I take another law job, I might never sort of get off the track again. And I had an idea for a book that I really wanted to write at that point. So everything came together. Um, so it was more like I was going towards something than I was uh, rejecting something. That's a really great way of putting it. I want everybody to think about that for a second. You'd rather fail as a writer than succeed as a lawyer. Yeah. That's kind of powerful. Well, and one of the ways that I realized I wanted to be a writer, and this is something that comes up in the happiness uh, realm, is a really good tool if you're trying to be happier is to think about whom do you envy. Because oh, okay. envy is a very negative emotion, but it tells you that somebody has something that you wish you had for yourself. And when I was reading, um, I was clerking, and I was reading, you know how you get that, that magazine from your college that tells you what everybody in your class is doing after graduation? And when I saw people that had really cool law jobs, I felt a kind of mild interest. And when I saw people who had really cool writing jobs, I felt sick mm -hmm. with envy. Oh, wow. And I thought, well, you know what? They have something that I wish I had, you know? So maybe I should try to get that for myself. I like how you turn envy around into a, such a positive force in your life. That's kind of badass. Well, because it's, it's painful. We don't even like to admit that we've, it uh -huh. feels shameful and, and, and awful. Um, but it can be this like big red, a warning sign. Like a friend of mine said, she was really envious of her coworker who was always taking all these exotic trips, and she was always sort of talking trash about her. Like, why is she always going on? All these? And then she's like, maybe I want to go on an exotic trip. Why don't I go on an exotic trip? I have all this vacation time. I never take it. I should go on a trip. That's why she just felt envy, and so that showed her what she wanted in her own life. All right, you're gonna teach me a couple more of those Jedi mind tricks on <laughs> okay. happiness in a little bit. But so the first book you wrote, was it the happiness book? Mm -mm, no. What was the first book you wrote? Well, the first book was a book that I thought of while I was working in Washington, and you, I think you'll appreciate this. It was called Power, Money, Fame, Sex, A User's Guide. And it well, was- I am interested yeah, yeah, yeah. You and, want to teach me about that It was a very DC <laughs> thing. Um, I was actually looking up at the Capitol Dome against the blue sky, and I was like, what am I interested that in, the, in that everybody in the world is interested in? And uh -huh. I thought, well, power, money, fame, sex. Um, and so is, it's a, it's a is book. Is that the four big drivers, you think? I think it is. Um, uh -huh. I mean, uh, the kind of worldly passions. Like yeah. somebody told me you should have three, red, white, and blue, don't have four. I'm like, okay, power, money, fame, sex, which one would you leave out? They, they're all important. Um, and it was actually good preparation for happiness because it's sort of like a very different way of looking at human nature. Um, and it's written as sort of a satiric guide. 
it's called a user's guide. It's like a user, someone who's a user. Um, so it's sort of true, but it's also sort of a joke. Yep. Um, so it was a really fun book to write. Kind of like the preppy handbook meets mm -hmm. Machiavelli. I love it. I, I th what's interesting about that is that I would have ordered those four totally differently oh. in different parts of my life. Yes, and it's kind of like a Rorschach test because people right. are like, why didn't you put this one first? This is the most important one. Uh -huh. But everybody disagrees about which one should come first. Yeah. When I was younger, obviously when I was younger, first was sex. Yeah. No question. Right, right, right. right. Like everything else was a pathway to get to sex. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. I would like to have power, I guess, to have yeah. sex. Yeah. I, would, yeah. I would like fame to get sex, <laughs> yes. right? Yes. 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 Um, the money thing is a little uncomfortable to talk about to get to sex, but um, okay. <laughs> so, but and fame, you know, um, that's very alluring. I mean, it's, look at America, right? Everybody's dying for fame. Look at what Donald Trump has done with, with fame. Yeah. But I've been lucky enough to recognize its emptiness, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's become a lot less relevant in my life, whereas I'm, I, I'm afraid of what I would have done earlier in my life mm -hmm. to get fame. Right. And thank God that it, it didn't wind up that way. But now I realize I, the most important thing is power, not because you want to be Dick Cheney uh, and be like, oh, I'm now going to rule over everybody. But you could use power for good, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so I just feel like, oh, I'm sure you could use all that for good. Sex, but, kind of. But, but that's the interesting thing. <laughs> yeah. I think you've pointed out something really important was, was that they often can be translated into others. Money can become power. Power can become money. Fame right. can become power. Power can become fame. And right. so they're all kind of morphing around once you get into that circle that you can start trading. Mm -hmm. and, and, but people make very different decisions about how do they ha want to use their power? Mm -hmm. um, do they want to use it to draw attention to a really important cause or do they want to use it to like uh, get kickbacks, you know? Mm -hmm. So I know that it was uh, the book was sarcastic, but give us a tip anyway on how to acquire power. How to acquire power? Um, well, one thing about power is that people who are powerful make demands, mm -hmm. um, and they expect them to be met. And I, I, and one of the ways that I became aware of this was when my sister's a very successful television writer, and when she was first going into Hollywood, she called a friend of mine who was older, because I'm older than my sister, older and very experienced in Hollywood ways. And he said, when you go to a meeting, if they say, would you like some coffee or something to drink? You say, yes, I would like something. I would like a cup of coffee um, with milk. And I was like, why do you do that? And he goes, because people who are powerful and confident, they make demands. Reasonable demands. They're not right. unreasonable. But they ask for something and they get it. And I was like, hmm. And I think it's interesting um, being, you know, just these little things sometimes really do kind of cue. Or like in Washington, D.C., um, whether you have a flag in your office, like mm -hmm. certain people have flags in their office, certain people don't have flags in their office. It's a sign of power if you have a, if you have a Is flag. Is that right? Yeah. Well, in the Young Turks sim symbol uh, that we have in the in the monitor in the studio in LA, is a giant flag. Yeah. Waving behind. So we are so powerful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, actually, but in all seriousness, I love that tip. And, yeah. And so it's it reminds me of my co-host Anna when she was in debate class. They taught her. When you come into the debate, make sure you move the furniture a little bit. Well, that's the same thing. It's like, I'm gonna suit this to myself. It's very, that's an exactly a, kind of a different iteration of the same principle, which is right. like, I'm a person who commands my space. I want everything to suit me, so I'm just gonna move everything a little yeah. bit. No, that's a great little tip. It is, and unfortunately, there are a lot, the way that human beings are built, you can play them, right? Yes. There's like little, and I don't mean that in necessarily, I mean, no, I do, I said unfortunately, I think I do mean it in a bad way that you can push certain buttons, right? Yeah. And hopefully you use that for good if you learn those tricks, right? I mean, hopefully you don't use it for bad. But but it's true, like you would, a lot of people might think, well, it's impolite to ask for such a specific yes. demand, right. Right? right? But in fact, no, that helps your cause. One of the other things that might be uh, is because of cognitive dissonance. Yeah. If I bother to get this yes. person right. specific good demand, good point. well, then I must have done it because they're important, right? Right. right. Because right. or I right. or I want you know I care. I yeah. care, or I have some value attached to that. Well, the interesting thing when I wrote the book is that one of the people that I the kind of uh, a, a group of people that I heard from a lot were people were like, I hate office politics. I'm bad at this, but this is like a revelation to me because they because if you're part of this game, none of it's new to you. Like you might even unconsciously do it, but it doesn't. It doesn't surprise you. But for a lot of people, it does not come naturally to them. So they felt like, oh my gosh, secrets revealed. Like I had no idea people were doing this. And maybe they're playing me because right. I'm the one 
one that's like, oh, no, no, don't bother. And I don't understand that somebody's taking advantage of a situation. So to my surprise, the, a big group of people who benefited from it were like, like exactly the kind of people who never wanted to read it. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, they did. And then they found like it kind of um, revealed to them a different way of looking at the world that was very helpful. OK, so then we go from power, money, fame, sex to happiness. Yeah, no, I, I wrote a biography of Churchill and a biography of Kennedy in between. <laughs> Yes. But no, unlike no. O'Reilly, you didn't kill them, right? No, 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 <laughs> no, no, uh, no I, it, it, those were great to do. And um, no, and so with The Happiness Project, a lot of people assume that's my first book, but it's like one of those things like after 10 years of writing, I was an overnight sensation. Kind I of got you. Okay. Yeah. But now, you, see, I love this conversation. I don't know how we can contain it. Because now you're going to make me ask questions about Churchill and Kennedy before we get to happiness. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I like big topics. Right. So Churchill, um, was Obama right to move the, his bust out of the White House? I don't know if he actually did that. Conservatives always love saying that. They might have made that up. But uh, you know, in, in all seriousness, um, a really complicated character, obviously very helpful that we had a guy like that on our side in World War II, uh, but a lot of South Asians don't yeah. find him to be a favorable character in right. history at all. Right. So what's your, is there a synopsis take on, on Churchill? Well, that is exactly what I wanted to highlight in this biography. So it's not a traditional biography. Same thing with the Kennedy. It's called 40 Ways to Look at Winston Churchill, 40 Ways to Look at JFK. And so instead of writing like, a, like having a view of Churchill and presenting the facts of his life in a single way and trying to persuade you, I show you all different ways of looking at Churchill and really try to highlight the different views. So the first chapter is sort of the short, heroic version of Churchill, 100% accurate, mm -hmm. but best case scenario. And then it's like the worst case of Churchill and putting the worst spin on everything. Again, 100% factual, absolutely true. And then in the, in the subsequent chapters, I try to go through and highlight different parts of it. And so you really have to decide for yourself, mm -hmm. how do, what's your judgment? Because he's this and he's that. And, 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 in some, and he was always the same. So in some circumstances, it was heroic and in some, it was despicable. And so at the end, I kind of get to my Churchill. But, um, but I really try to highlight through by, by just these juxtapositions, showing that there are many different ways to look at a tremendous figure like Churchill. There's no one unified Who's version. Who's your Churchill? My Churchill is, I think, the transcendent, timeless Churchill who you know, was fighting for the country he loved, who had these values. And that, and was limited by his time and his perspective, um, but was truly trying to do, to live up to his vision of what of 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 England. So um, and there were there were downsides of that, obviously, and I write about them extensively. So you're taking a, a view of it as like the founding fathers. You yeah. can't excuse their slavery, but you can't put it in the context of the historical period and say that within that context. They did some wonderful things. Well, and we have to understand them from, from where they stood. Um, and that doesn't mean we can't judge them. Um, and, uh, and, it, and, and it's not to say that someone couldn't come to a very different conclusion, because right. they're looking at it from a different way. And what I try, by 40 ways, I was just trying to show the, the kind of the, the limits of biography, that there is no one unified version of How could there be one unified uh, you know, way to, how can I sum you up and come to a conclusion about you? Because right. there's so many ways that I could be, be evaluating you. so many different you. perspectives yeah. on what I've done, what Churchill's yeah. done. And Churchill, I mean, he, right. he did everything. That's right. Literally. All right, one question about Kennedy. Uh, who killed him? Oswald. <laughs> okay, wrong. CIA, but that's no, okay. No, we can agree no. to disagree. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. We can agree to disagree on that. Okay, we'll yeah. move forward. Yeah. Okay, so happiness. How yeah. do I get it? There's two answers to that question, depending on what framework you use. Now, ancient philosophers and contemporary scientists would agree if you had to pick one thing, because you're saying, like, what's the key? Mm -hmm. If you had to pick one key, that's one thing that's the key to happiness, one thing is, you could say, is relationships. Hmm. To be happy, we have to have strong relationships. We have to have, be able to confide. We need to feel like we belong. We need to be able to get support. Just as important, we need to be able to give support. Um, and so anything that makes us deepen or, or broaden our relationships is likely to make us happier. And when you look at the people who are the happiest, they're the ones that have the most rich relationships in their lives. So you could say relationships. But there's another way you can answer that question. And that's by saying self-knowledge. Um, that really the way that we can be happy is when we accept ourselves. We accept ourselves and expect more from ourselves. But when we build a life around our own nature, our own values, our own interests, not a fantasy self, um, not what other people expect of us, not what we wish we were, 
um, but what's actually true about us, then we can become happier because our life is a true reflection of our values and also what we, what we want to aspire to be. Because just because you accept yourself doesn't mean that you can't expect more from yourself. Um, so I think those are, those are two different ways of saying like what's the key to happiness um, and they're both right. So let me flesh that out more. So yeah, I, one of my favorite very simple quotes is know thyself yes. from Socrates. All right, well it's on yeah. the temple of Apollo at Delphi. It's the oldest advice in the world. It's 100% true and it's the great challenge of our lives to yeah. know thyself. So let's uh, take that a step further. So let's say I figured out who I am. Mm -hmm. How do I then use that to make myself happier? Well, that's really important. So it's very hard to know yourself. So um, well done if you know yourself. Um, like me, I know I'm meant to be a male model. It's yeah, obvious. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, obvious. Yeah. You've accepted that fate. I, I have. What, what can you do? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, as one does. Um, um, well, once you know yourself, it's to say, and this comes up in habits all the time, because a lot of times I find that when people fail, when they keep trying and failing with a habit, it's because in some way they haven't accepted what's true about them. Um, like people are always saying, you should be able to, you should be able to have one cookie a night. You should be able to get up early and go mm -hmm. for a run. You should be able to study for the GRE without taking a class. Okay, you should be able to, big warning sign, right? Mm -hmm. Who says you should be able to? What's true about you? So you might, people say that. No, you might say, well, I'm a night person. I can't get up early and go for a run. I'm at my most productive, creative, and energetic later in the day. So I've got to exercise later in the day. It's not going to make sense for me to try to do it early mm -hmm. in the morning. That's who I am. Um, one of the things that I had to accept about myself is like, I don't really like music that much, which is, you know, I feel kind of bad about it because I see the cultural value of it. I see that other people enjoy it. It's not that I, it's not that I, 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 um, don't get it why people like it. It's just that I personally am just not that into music. And I had to let go of the fantasy that somehow I could become that kind of person. So or that's pretend. such a great example. Let's pause there for a second. Because it does, there's like this weird societal pressures you don't, you're not even cognizant of. Yeah. Because I'm not into music either. You're not. Right. There so we we're, go. we're soulmates on that. And like people go to concerts yeah. and they seem like they're having such yeah, a good time. I, I, I kind of, I borderline yeah. despise concerts. And so, I don't get it. I, yeah, I mean, and I had a, and like sports, I'm like, it's hard for me to imagine that somebody would want to do that. That they would like, I get that they could have the moral rectitude and that self discipline to force themselves to go play tennis or something, but I'm like, the idea that you would actually look forward to it and want to do it, like, I can't, I can't wrap my yeah, mind Yeah, everybody's around that. different. And yeah. let's acknowledge that rectitude is a funny word. Um, so, for me, like, people say, like, oh, well, you, you've been jogging for, you know, 25 years aren't, or 20 years or whatever. Like, don't you get a high off of it? I'm like, no, I kind of I, I kind of hate it every it's time. It's the myth of the high. I'm <laughs> right. like, yeah, don't wait for the high. <laughs> right. Um, Whereas I love competition, so I love sports. Yes. Right. So it took me a long time to realize that it's okay for me to say, yeah, I, I don't like concerts. I don't want to go to that yeah, concert. Yeah, I don't want to go to that concert. Right. But see, but see, knowing that you like competition, like maybe you would form your habits in a way so that you could tap into that more. And so instead of exercising in a way that's no fun for you, maybe you could figure out a way to, to harness that love of competition. See, I don't like competition. So something would become less fun for me. It would be harder to make it a habit if there was a competitive thing. Like if I was in an office where they're like, we're all gonna compete to see who can get the most miles done. Like that would turn me off, but that might make it more fun for you. And so that's well, a way- Well, if you did that, then you had, you ruined my life because I spend the rest of my time making sure I won. Well, see, well, but I mean, but in, but you could maybe figure out a way to make help help out help your habits that way because it make right. it more fun for you and it would tap into your nature. But again, this competition makes something less fun for you or more fun for you is a very important thing. Is a really helpful thing to know about yourself. That's funny. What my wife and I just had a conversation about this. I think maybe yesterday, where she keeps wanting me to do cross fitness, but I'm like, yes, that will be too hard for me. Not that I can't do it. I know I can do it but it'll make me not want to exercise, so it'll be counterproductive. Yes, but that shows a lot of self-knowledge. That's, I mean, well done, because I think a lot of times people don't know themselves well enough to say like, this isn't right for me, and often they'll try something and then fail, and it's like, oh, there must be something wrong with me because it worked, CrossFit works so well for my wife, and I know all these people are so into CrossFit, I must be lazy, I must be weak-willed, I must, have, I must lack, lack self-control. No, this is it, like for whatever reason, CrossFit isn't for you. Fine, there's like a million other things you could do. So people beat themselves up instead of saying, this is not a good fit. What are the other choices, you know? So is it uh, like the Taoist said, be the river? Like the, that just go with the flow of your life that, not, now I don't mean flow of your life like, oh, I don't know, dude, and just, get, yeah. but like figure out who you yes. are and understand what that flow is, what your yes. dharma is in that sense. And so then your life will be smoother because you're on the right track as opposed to trying to fit into the wrong track. Right, 100%. That's a great way to put it because 
like, I think a lot of times people feel like there should be these magic one-size-fits-all solutions. And certainly habit experts often like proclaim them, like do it first thing in the morning, start small, give yourself a cheat day, do it for 30 days, that's the answer. No, I mean it might work for some people sometimes, it doesn't mean it works for everybody. And so again, like yeah, if you can tap, the more you can understand who you are and like channel that, so it's just, you're just running on that track, you're gonna have much better success. Okay, one more thing about happiness. Um, I've uh, listened to a couple of professors whose expertise is happiness, and one thing they seem to really focus on is being appreciative. Mm -hmm. um, did you find that as well? Is, yeah. that a, is that a big factor? No, gratitude is a big, big element of a happy life, and, um, and it's, but one of the things that people, and everybody knows this about gratitude, is that often it's the things that you should be most grateful for that you never even think of. So you, it's like, do I wake up every day and like hop out of bed excited because I have electricity? No, or like, uh, and so it, I think a lot of people need some kind of happiness, I mean, some kind of gratitude practice where they really like get themselves to remember to be grateful for things that are important to them. Um, now, I kept, a lot of times you see like, oh, you should keep a gratitude journal, and I have to say, I tried that and it like, made me crazy. It was like the opposite of happiness right, producing. Right. I hated keeping a gratitude journal. But one thing I do is every time I go in and out of my apartment, we have these sort of double doors in our lobby where you have to use a key to get in and out. And so I'll say like, oh, how happy I am to be going out into New York City, my favorite city. How happy I am to be coming back home to my apartment. You know. Um, so I think sometimes, or I've heard of people using their passwords as gratitude reminders, people mm -hmm. using their screensavers, people doing like gratitude exercises in their com during their commute, like whatever would work for you, but just remind yourself to be grateful. So there's a lot of similarities that you and I have in that regard. Uh, so one of the professors said do, like before you go to bed, uh, think about five things that went right that day. And so, so I tried that I for a while, that, man, it and it became like homework, I know. and it made me less happy. Yes, I completely <laughs> agree. It's, and I got very resentful of it. It did not. I agree. I, I don't think that works for everybody. Right, but I, I'm, and then this is probably why I, overall in life I'm a very happy guy, even though I rant on the show about things I'm pissed about or injustice and all that stuff. But in my personal life, I'm very happy because I'm the kind of guy who's like. Air conditioning. I know. God, I love it. I know. Right. Thank God we discovered yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> good, right? To be appreciative of the little things. Yeah, yeah. and we were talking yeah. before we got started about LA. I live in yeah. LA. And I mean, so on, on half the days, I'll be like, oh, LA, I love LA. That's so great. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, look yeah. at this. It's February. This is ridiculous. Look at how great a life we have. In, I feel, February. I feel like I feel the same way about New York City. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, so I'm from like a very suburban type place. And what I love about New York City is it just feels limitless. It feels inexhaustible. And just like when I come home like from the airport or I'm just like go walking around, I'm always seeing things I've never seen before, even like on my own block. And, and then there's whole parts of town. I'm like, I've never been on this street before. And I love it. And I just think like even when, like when I'm at my lowest point and my so blue, I just think about New York City and it just makes me happier because I'm so grateful for New York City. So I, to love where you live. I wrote Happier at Home, which is another book about happiness. And there I talked a lot about the importance of home and, and loving your, and which includes your neighborhood, your hometown and all that. Um, and if, if you're not happy at home, it's hard to be happy. And so, yeah, being happy at home is very So how, how, do you, how do you get happier at home? Part of it is knowing yourself. You know, um, and it's funny because all of my books kind of run together because uh, like a lot of the stuff that I studied in happiness then ended up coming up in habits. So for instance, one of the things that you notice a lot in, in homes and often also offices is that some people are abundance lovers and some people are simplicity lovers. Mm -hmm. Some people want bare surfaces and clean shelves and walls with nothing on them and quiet and like, you know, one perfect thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then some people are abundance lovers and they like collections and profusions and a lot of stuff on the wall and like buzz and people running around. And it's not that one person's right and one person's wrong. It's not that one home is the more serene environment. It's not that one workplace is the more creativity inducing environment. It's just that you and I are different and you want one kind of environment and I want another kind of environment. But a lot of times in their homes, people are told, you should simplify, get rid of everything, then you'll be happier. Not if you're a person who loves profusion and abundance. And then, you know, oh, well, you, what you need to do is like, you know, put a bunch of stuff on the walls and express yourself. Well, if you're a simplicity lover, that's not gonna be the right environment for you. So again, it's always, it's, and it also with your habits. If you love a lot of choice and abundance, join a gym that's got a million choices. And today I'm gonna spin, and tomorrow I'm gonna do yoga, and today I'm gonna lift weights. And then another, like I'm a simplicity lover. I go to a gym 
high intensity weight training. You do like six machines and you're out. Like, can you do a cardio machine? No, they don't have them. Like, it's so simple. It's so, like, it's very, very few things and no choices. And I love that. But some people would make them crazy. So, so, so but what if you're married? Yeah. <laughs> and I know you are, yeah. right? And I yeah. am. No. So, like, your thing of find your Zen, your Dharma, whatever, and then work your way towards it because it'll make you happier. Super logical. But life is full of compromise, whether yes. it's at home or it's at work, yeah. et cetera. So Your how team. do you deal with that? Well, I think that part of it is that it's easier when, I, one of the things I try to do in all my books is to create a vocabulary so that we can talk about it. Because, because a lot of times it's just this like, you're wrong. How can you feel like, how can you get anything done with your desk like this? I mean, oh my gosh, I'm like, I, we've got all this stuff around. Like, let's get rid of it. Nobody likes this. It's just like, okay, you're just accusing me of being wrong. Um, but if we can just say like, you like it one way, I like it another way. How do we find a place where we can both meet? Then, then there's no judgment. There's no like, you should do it my way. Because a lot of times, it's one person really says, I'm right, mm -hmm. you're wrong. So I'm the boss, so I want everybody to have a desk like mine. Because it's because it works for me. I think it's like, this is how people, I'm productive. This is how everybody's productive, not necessarily. Or it's my, you know, I live in this house, and I feel overwhelmed if there's too much stuff going on. Well, maybe other people like find that exciting and interesting. So. I think when you can talk about it, it's, you, you, then you don't have to be accusatory. It's just like, well, how do we get to a place where we can, because maybe some rooms can be simpler and some rooms can be more, like there can be more going on. Like my study could be done in any yeah. way I like if I, right. if I had a study. But right. <laughs> yeah, I see what you're saying. Right, right. And, and or like the, the way, bedroom, you could say like, it's really hard for me to feel calm in a bedroom where there's a lot going on. So I get it like in the living room and the kitchen and all this, I can take it, but I really need the bedroom to be really dialed back. Um, because for me, that's where, I, and then some, probably somebody could say like, I get it, you know, like I want the living room to be like exciting and a lot going on and this is what I feel like it's gonna express us. But, you know, I, there's, it's easier to compromise when you understand what the terms are because a lot of times I feel like we're just like talking about these vague disagreements that go in circles. Right. It's in my experience, that's what often happens. Yeah, no, no, that's great because this actually goes to one of the themes that we talk about on the Young Turks all the time which is understanding each other's perspectives. Yes. So we talk about it on a macro level, on racial issues, for example. Yes. Hey, can you see that you might not have a trouble with cops, but yes. this person grew up their whole life with cops harassing them, so their perspective might be different. Let's right. understand each other's perspectives. Yeah. That's enormously true also at home, at work, yes. et cetera. Because it's human nature to think that it's, it's almost impossible to not see the world through the lens of your own experience and to remember Hardest thing in the world yeah and to remember like just because it works for me doesn't mean it works for someone else just because it's fun for me doesn't mean it's fun for someone else just because i need this to be productive or creative or energetic or yeah, healthy it doesn't mean that it's going to work for somebody else and, and especially in better than before i really try to highlight a bunch of different things where you could be one way and I could be another way so that people can be aware, okay, there's, I, have, I have a terminology for this and there's no judgment attached to it. Um, because it's not that one is right and one is wrong. It's just that we need to understand how other people could be, because the thing is, basically we're all very much the same, but the differences are very important. And it's hard sometimes, especially if it's a subtle difference, it might be very significant, but it might be hard to recognize until somebody points it out to you. Yep, okay, uh, let's go to habits. Um, so how do I, if I have a bad habit, if, of course, I'm sure yeah, I don't. Yeah, we all do, we all right do, now. yeah. <laughs> um, how do I break it? Am I supposed to break it? That's a different question. So what I found is that there are actually 21 strategies that we can use to make or break habits. And you use the same 21 whether you're making them or breaking them. And a lot of times with a habit, you know, you could, you could frame it in the positive or the negative. So you could say, well, I want to give up sugar, or you could say I want to eat more healthfully. And it doesn't really matter um, because the same strategies will come into play. But the key thing, again, is to, to what we were talking about before, is when you look at the 21 strategies to think, well, what would work for you? What's true about you so that you can pick and choose from the 21 for the ones that are going to work for you and you can set them up in a way so that you set yourself up for success. Okay, so you mentioned three in the title. Are those the most important three, procrastinating, sleep, and sugar? No, I, no I, 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 those were helpful for me. Um, or ones that I looked at particularly. There's certainly ones that come up all the time that people mention, um, but everybody has the, their own kind of cast of habits that they are, are fighting. Um, there are four habits that are particularly, habit areas that are particularly important because they go right to self-command, which is what's important when you're trying to change your habits. And that's um, habits related to eating and drinking right, 
Um, one reason that people eat too much is they don't eat enough. Like they skip breakfast, skip lunch, and then they go nuts, you know, and eat everything unhealthy and for dinner. Um, getting enough sleep, which goes right to energy and self-command. Um, exercise, a lot of times people think that they're too tired to exercise, but exercise actually boosts energy and focus. It like, on the one hand, it makes us more energetic. On the other hand, it calms us down. It's like this magic elixir of life. And then the last one is kind of surprising, which is that for most people, uncluttering, um, even if you're an abundance lover, if you like to, like having things in the right places, being able to find something when you're looking for it, not being surrounded by a bunch of stuff that doesn't work or that you don't use, that seems to help people have more self-command. And just think about yourself, if you go into a kitchen where everything's put away neatly, are you gonna grab a, you know, a box of crackers and eat half of it? You're less likely to than if you walk into a kitchen where like everything's out and kind of half open and on the counter and you just feel this sort of general sense of like anything goes. Is it okay for me to uh, continue to eat because I love it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody has their own set of things that they worry about. Now, mm -hmm. like, I'm one of those crazy low-carb people that you read about. Like, I'm mm -hmm. a super zealous person about eating an extremely low-carb diet, and I love it. It really works for me. But everybody has to decide what works for them, what they value, what's important to them. Okay, uh, makes yeah. sense. And you've given me enough confidence in, well, you know, in knowing myself yeah. that I can say, that's okay. I, 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 I enjoy being a fat ass. <laughs> but I'll do my exercise, I'll keep healthy to the best of my abilities, but that's who I am. So everybody who keeps yelling at me to stop eating, I don't overeat, I just eat really bad food because I love it. Yeah, like what do you eat? I'm just curious. Uh, peanut butter, banana milkshake, God's okay. food, okay? Uh -huh. uh, anything wrapped in bacon, God's um, food. Oh, I love bacon. Right. You get low carb, you can eat tons of bacon. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. back to habits. Uh, I think last thing is it uh, is it more important to break bad habits or more important to have create good habits? Well, again, you, you can sort of see them as both um, because e each habit is sort of contains its opposite, um, and so I think it's. And, and, and they talk about people being prevention focused or promotion focused. That's one of the things uh, habit experts often emphasize. And so it's sort of whatever works for you. Like you might respond more to the idea of like, I want to make my life better. I want to like get more out of life. I want to feel great. And that might get you more geared up. But other people, it might be more um, compelling to think about things like, I don't want to get sick. Um, I want to, you know, I don't, I don't want to uh, miss work. Because uh, and and to think about avoiding problems or making sure that you stick to your duties. So again, it's like there's no right way or wrong way to bring these things. It's really what is most compelling to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, finally, uh, back to happiness for a second. Uh, you studied happiness. Did it actually make you happy? It did. Well, here's the thing. Um, research shows that about 50% of happiness is genetically determined. So mm -hmm. you know, you're born in. Uh, 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 um, a Tigger or an Eeyore, and that's pretty much hardwired. And then about 10 to 20% is life circumstances. That's things like age, income, occupation, education, health. And then all the rest is very much a matter of your conscious thoughts and actions. And so if I'm lying in bed at night waiting to fall asleep or I'm on the subway, I go back to seven, because on the one to 10 scale, I'm about a seven. I'm, you know, not too much of one thing or the other. Um, and so in that way, I did not change. But what changed was the experience of my life changed. So I have so much more joy and excitement, and I spend more time with friends, I have more friends, um, and I have much less feeling angry, guilty, um, uh, bored, because I did, and, 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 it, and, and knowing how to think about happiness has really informed my decisions so that I can make happier decisions going forward. For instance, um, I now have a podcast with my sister called Happier with Gretchen Rubin, and when I was thinking about starting it, you know, it was like this big thing. I didn't. I had never done a podcast. I was going to have to learn all this new stuff. It was going to be a lot more work where I already felt very busy. Um, it could fail. It could be a very public flop. Mm -hmm. But I know enough about happiness now that I started going through it. I'm like, well, it'll, it's novelty and challenge. And novelty and challenge bring happiness. And it's going to deepen my relationship with my sister, which was one of the most important relationships in my life. So that's going to make me happier. And it's going to increase my engagement with my readers. And that's something that I love. And so I was able to look at it and say, like, OK, is, this, is, is, this, is the decision to do this likely to make me happier or not? And it was very clear. And it turned out to be. Like, my podcast makes me very happy. But I feel like 10 years ago, I might have, like, done a completely different analysis of like, you know, time management or something like that. Like, do I have time to do this? It's like, you have time to do whatever you want, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like it, I am a lot happier. Not because I changed my, my inner self, 
but because I've changed the decisions that I make and the way I go through my day in a way that really makes me happier. That's good news. So I, I love to hear that it, it can make a difference. We can actually uh, get better for whatever better means to yeah, us. Better and, than before. Right, and, and happier and stuff. So that's great. There's a lot that I took away from this interview. Uh, and and though I'm going to come back to the, to the thing we started with. And, it, and as you were talking, I realized I would rather fail at trying to do the right thing through new media and challenging the way the, the media and the government works than succeed at traditional media mm. and, and being part of that establishment tr structure. Like that is that is so stark for me. Yeah. Like success in that other realm right. is Wouldn't, no success at all. Yeah. You right? want to be out there on the cutting edge. Yeah. Experimenting, trying, failing, learning. Right. Cool. So uh, helpful. Thank yeah. you so much. And I'm going to read uh, the title of the new uh, uh, book again, one more time. Better than before, what I learned about making and breaking habits to sleep more, quit sugar, procrastinate less, and generally build a happier life. Gretchen Rubin. Thank you so much thank for joining you. us. Thank you. So much fun.